Yes, uh, ha very happy to share the stage today with David. Uh, we will have a handover, which I will hopefully not botch. Um, we will start to talk about uh, our roadmap towards useful quantum computing, um, and then hand over and talk a little bit about uh, our recent news in productization, which involves the inclusion of the Planck platform into the Kipu family. Um, towards useful quantum computing, Always a uh, tough act to follow Heike, <laughs> who gave a very uh, nice presentation about quantum, so I don't need to talk a lot about the backgrounds and the details. Um, I think what's asto astonishing to me is that quantum is now really moving um, outside of the labs into the data centers. I couldn't resist the, 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 the chance to also pick this cute spin <coughs> queue quantum computer um, on the slide. So we could say that it's even moving on our desks if you want to invest 5,000 euros for a, a toy-sized quantum computer that has uh, two qubits. So no quantum advantage from that, but I think it's interesting that, uh, that this is now also an opportunity. Um, Qubits have been steadily improving. I think IBM was one of the main commercial drivers amongst uh, others, also in the startup ecosystem for that, for that growth. But I think to have uh, a strong quantum advantage, uh, including um, error correction, this is going to still take a while. Um, you know, there are several estimates on how many qubits you would require and in including that overhead, and um, especially when using standard algorithms. Uh, um, <coughs> like Shaw's algorithm, which is of course not useful for derivative pricing or protein folding, but it's one of the flagship algorithms, uh, was essentially developed in uh, 1997. I think it's fair to say that many of the people that are now building quantum computers were not even born in 1997. So of course this was something that was not really developed having the capabilities of what we have actually today in mind. At Kipu, um, we think that this needs to change. We are developing, alg we are developing algorithms to uh, fundamentally break these kind of time estimates. We think that uh, usefulness using these new algorithmic approaches is much closer compared to using uh, these old-fashioned uh, um, hardware agnostic algorithms, and we are essentially now commercializing that. Um, to make that very concrete, um, we think that we can drastically reduce the necessity uh, for having very, very large and very, very high fidelity quantum processors by, ma by maybe not even requiring error correction for the, for the kind of tr computations we could do. And there's an estimate uh, um, published in the team. There's, there will be some claims. There will always be a source of a paper or a webinar uh, in the bottom left, which you can follow up. Um, we think that we can actually bring down usefulness uh, um, into the very near future, by for, for example, for protein folding, by bringing it down from millions to maybe thousands of improved qubits. This is achieved by having a specific type of algorithm. Um, we are developing algorithms in a way of making them um, application-specific. So we are really accounting for the mathematical structure of the problem um, in a much more profound way than conventional algorithms are typically doing. And we are also making algorithms in a hardware-specific way. So this is essentially leveraging certain types of operations that are maybe beyond Hadamard gates and C0 gates and so on that contemporary quantum hardware can leverage to encode a lot of complexity with uh, fairly good fidelity. And of course, this gives another boost to solving more complicated problems um, on near-term quantum computing uh, processors. We've demonstrated uh, this not only in extrapolations, but also in, um, um, in real implementations on quantum computers. So for example, some exploits have been demonstrating a drastic reduction in time to usefulness by 500x compared to other quantum algorithms. We've managed to show that we can increase success probabilities by 600x, so likely to finding the correct answer with a single shot, essentially, as well as improving the, the answer, um, for example, for chemistry-type modeling. Um, use cases that can be tackled with these approaches are very broad. So we are talking about combinatorial optimization, network resilience, which is, for example, relevant for the energy and telco sectors. Uh, you can also couple this with neural networks uh, um, or do something like protein uh, folding, uh, for example. Um, one, pr one, uh, one project, uh, which I will not talk about in detail, but which will be actually discussed by um, Gernot uh, of my team and Avishek of the BSF team later this afternoon, was a very small pro uh, problem that has uh, re relevance for logistics. We are not super proud because the problem was so large, but because we've, we've able to um, outperform other quantum algorithms by actually a, a quite impressive margin. So this shows that we can solve uh, 
more tricky problems uh, compared to other quantum algorithms. I think this is the main merit here. And I referred to Gernot and Abhishek to talk about the details of that project uh, later, later today, essentially. On the other side, we've worked with Mass Mobile, um, that's a Spanish telecommunications player. They recently rebranded to Mass Orange. They did a joint venture, essentially. We looked at networks, uh, network resilience optimization, so they, of course, want to have good coverage for their customers in the telco sector. Um, and we've managed to pr map 10% of the real problem against 140 qubits of QRS hardware for a specific type of problem. That was super impressive for us because it was much closer to real problem sizes compared to what we did in the work with the BASF team. And there's also a very nice trajectory towards usefulness because uh, um, I think I would say quantitatively similar to what, what IBM is on, on their roadmap, but also QERA promises uh, 3,000 qubits by next year and 10,000 qubits by 2026. That's physical qubits. We also use physical qubits. So this shows that we are also ad ad advancing towards a regime where at least mapping the full problem on a quantum processor seems to become more feasible. On the other side, we also combined uh, our quantum um, technology with uh, classical neural networks. We've managed to show that we can improve the performance in, for example, uh, figuring out uh, if a breast scan uh, has cancer in it or not um, incrementally, but I think this is uh, super valuable if, if we are talking about healthcare. And more than that, we've managed to show that we can do this with much, much fewer training parameters, essentially. So using a thousand times fewer parameter to get an improved result with quantum technology. That's kind of um, approaching usefulness also, I would say. Um, Beyond that, I think this paper was even mentioned by, he by Heike on this grid with a lot of publications talking about uh, more than 100 qubits. Um, this is a result we're also very proud about. Um, this was done using all 156 qubits of one of IBM's uh, newest uh, processors, essentially. Um, we also used the Hubo mapping, higher um, order unconstrained binary optimization, unlike Kubo. We think that this is, uh, we know that Hubo is much more difficult to solve than Kubo. Uh, we also think that it's much more relevant for real-world applications. If you want to do mapping against Hubo, you will find it likely mo more easier than trying to squeeze a complicated problem into a Kubo mapping. And you know, there are some things like protein folding, financial modeling, or mixed integer optimization that will most likely be enabled by these kind of uh, technologies. So this is another proof point. And I think I've shown you a nice escalation from the toy size problem at BASF showing out performance all the way to also venturing in this regime of utility as coined by IBM, solving very large uh, problems. Um, and we think that this is kind of a stepping stone. Um, we think that we are now on a pathway to demonstrate a narrow demonstration of usefulness, maybe in the next year and a half to three years, based on our own algorithmic development plus hardware development. Of course, this will rely on mapping an industry use case against more than 100 qubit. Anything less than that is fairly easy to simulate, I think it's fair to say that. Um, it will be about figuring out a dense enough uh, NP-hard problem. It has to be dense enough because the denser it is, the more difficult it is, and NP-hard because, uh, you know, why using quantum if, if, that's not, if that's not the case. We are now actively looking for collaboration partners uh, to actually go down that route together with us. We think that uh, figuring out what kind of problem can be mapped against the Hubo problem is not something that we should do all by our own. So the, the real knowledge about how is the mathematical structure, how could we use Hubo mapping in a smart way to actually encode industrial relevant problems also requires us to not only partner with hardware vendors on the quantum side, but also with uh, end users at the end of the day that have, of course, more intimate knowledge about these kind of problems that, that, us, uh, that, that we want to solve to drive uh, forward the field. So that's kind of our roadmap. This is where we are. We are collaborating in PUC projects, so happy to talk about this. Handing it now over to David, that will talk about our product platform as well as Plunk. Thank you very much, Daniel. Pleasure to share the stage here, um, after all these distinguished other speakers. Uh, I hope you all heard the news that during the summer break, um, Kipu was quite busy and quite ambitious and also quite brave in taking a very drastic step for a young startup uh, by acquiring the Planck platform as well as all the associated QC business from Anaco AG. Some of you may know me from that previous title. Um, so this is why we're now here on this stage and as it very nicely says on this uh, slide, now together. Um,
Kipu acquired the Planck platform for two primary reasons. One is really the collaboration aspect that Daniel just mentioned. The idea here is that the Planck platform will be the vehicle for accessing the Kipu algorithms. And secondly, also to make sure that the collaboration that we want to um, achieve, not only with the hardware side, but also with all the industrial and academic players that are um, really a key driver in making sure that we bring quantum to a broader usefulness can be um, it can be done together. So to that end, um, Kipu this summer integrated the entire Planck platform as well as the associated team. And this now um, builds on top of the already quite prevalent um, algorithmic expertise that I think Daniel really <laughs> nicely pointed out. Um, that is already part of the uh, Kipu DNA. So we're really proud to be now part of that and um, to walk these paths together. Now, I want to make a couple of points abundantly clear. And the first one is Planck is and will remain an open ecosystem. Kipu is 100% committed to the open community-centric approach that we have been building with Planck over the past year, so we will directly base on that. Quite the opposite. It doesn't, the acquisition of Kipu doesn't mean that Planck now becomes a platform that is only used for the Kipu algorithms. It's the complete opposite. Of course, the Kipu algorithms will be exclusively available through the Planck platform, but we will also make sure that um, also other, provi uh, other uh, software providers can use the platform in order to base their applications on our algorithms and use the platform to um, approach the market with their applications. So that stays the same. Also, we will continue to work with industrial clients for the proof of concept projects, as Daniel just mentioned, and we, um, and we will, as Kipu, um, make sure that we provide the relevant hardware access um, both to industrial players as well as academic organizations. And speaking about the academic organizations and the community approach, um, given the fact that uh, we have also several representatives here from uh, the federal government, both the Ministry of Economic Affairs as well as the uh, um, Ministry of Research and Academia, Bank will also stay a platform to be able to continue the deployment of results, of research results. So this is still a valuable outlet to continue propagating research results, collaborating with other uh, research and industrial players in furthering our understanding of the quantum uh, world, of the quantum realm. And so uh, the community platform um, of Planck will be uh, actually enhanced by Kipu's understanding of quantum algorithms. Um, this collaboration with um, academic players uh, across the stage that only takes place on a regional or a national level but really on an international level. We're committed to um, furthering the understanding of both the algorithmic approach as well as uh, the collaboration with hardware specific initiatives um, Primarily, of course, in Europe, but um, those of you who have actually followed our recent, um, I'd say, LinkedIn exploits have seen that uh, we have also um, taken several steps to ensure that um, we bring this understanding of uh, useful quantum computing not only um, to our, let's say, home market of Germany and Europe, but also um, to the Middle East, to India and to Canada most recently. How do we do that? Well, I, I just mentioned um, in the first slide that we have already, uh, th that we intend to make the Kipu algorithms available through Planck, and the first one is actually already on it. So you can scan that QR code, that will take you directly to the registration page for Planck, or if you already have an account, you will find the Kipu uh, uh, DCQO algorithm, as we call it. Um, you will find it on the platform, on the marketplace. You can play around with it for free. So Kipu stands by its word, the commitment to the open ecosystem. And it's actually the basis um, for a more, let's say, advanced algorithm that we will publish later this year on the Planck platform. And that was actually the basis for this awesome paper that was uh, featured in Heike's presentation and that Daniel was just um, mentioning earlier. So we will continue this uh, community-centric approach. Um, we have done the first step and be 
uh, be assured, there will be more algorithms that we um, th that we will publish on uh, our Plunk platform, but um, we also want to continue the engagement with the community. So, uh, two more QR codes for you to scan. Um, the first one um, on the left-hand side, you will see we are holding a industry forum, a Kipu industry forum right here in Berlin. It's actually two months from now, uh, on November 7th. Uh, really uh, cool location, a little bit uh, further outside the city, but uh, I can <laughs> tell you it, it's quite an, a sight to see. Um, we will talk about uh, the latest showcases, so really dive into the details of what um, Daniel just um, let's say, teased earlier. We will dive a little bit deeper into that together with industry partners. But we will also invite the entire Plunk community to join us there to talk about new features for the Plunk platform, to talk about ways to enhance their collaboration. Because, And I think that's a very important aspect. To us, we are driving the quantum ecosystem with Plunk. And it is not a, let's say, um, effort that is... Uh, um, in contrast or in uh, competition to IBM's effort or to other, for what uh, Christine mentioned earlier from T-Systems. To us, this really is something to add on to it. All of us bring individual expertises to um, the journey towards useful quantum computing. And to us, with our Plank platform, this and the algorithms that Kipu develops, um, as Daniel mentioned, they are individual hardware specific. So we are purely committed to making sure that we're working with all relevant players in the field and that we're not um, creating boundaries or walls to that effect. And so to not create any walls, um, and the uh, other point that I want to make is here, um, next month we'll have a webinar. We'll actually talk about um, different features of the Plunk platform and particularly dive into the DCQO algorithm, how you can use it. Um, Her, hear a little bit from you, what you might want to try out with it. Uh, we will give you some insights of what we have done with it already, um, how you can use it, um, and also, of course, talk a little bit about what are the next steps with regards to um, the further development of those. So lots of uh, information for you to <laughs> process, I hope. Um, no worries. Um, I know we are a little bit behind time, so um, I'll just say we are here today and tomorrow, not only Daniel and myself, but you have uh, Sarah and Johanna um, sitting here, but they will also be uh, outside. You have um, Gernot, who is together with uh, Abhishek, holding the talk this afternoon. Um, Toby, one of your co-founders, um, will also one of our co-founders will also join uh, later for a panel today. So I hope that um, we've given you lots of things to process, lots of questions to ask. Um, we're looking forward to discussing them with you and we're hoping to see you at the next events, not only ours, but also all the others where we'll be at. Thank you very much. <laughs>